one of the biggest analogies I can give you is when you look at tsunamis coming inland, you never see dead wild animals. They go. Yeah, they gone. They got it. We, we, we ain't hanging around. There's something coming. Something wicked. This way it comes. You they start chirping humans, humans, you know, we just get the selfies out. We're taking selfies of the wave coming in. People are in other hotels videotaping their own friends and family getting swept away. And because we're not connected to this planet anymore the way that we should be, we're not in, in Schumann resonant frequency with it. We're not uh, intuitively being in sync with nature. And uh, part of that is because, in my opinion, if you go back far enough, I do believe that human beings or hominids, I should say hominids, were seated on this planet. At least that's what the Aboriginal elders say. They said they were brought here by the Pleiadians and they were the first hominids here on this planet. Uh, that were brought here and seated by the Pleiades. That's their handed down history for thousands of years. Crystal magnetite in the brain, okay? So we talked about this. It's actually in there, guys. It's a lot towards the cerebellum and the brain stem. That's where the majority of it's actually located. A lot of people have always seen, you know, Jesus with the, you know, with the thorns, the, the crown of thorns. It's really a representation because after all my extensive research, I don't believe that he was actually crucified on any kind of cross or anything like that. Just my personal opinion. I don't want to offend anybody, but that's my personal opinion. The Sinai Bible, there was never a crucifixion, and that predates the modern King James Version of the Bible. Never a crucifixion. It was orchestrated by Rome. The story was orchestrated by Rome. But where does the esoteric message here? The neural correlates of consciousness, the parts of your brain that generate self-awareness, researchers at the Allen Institute for Brain Science discovered three giant neurons one of them is projected across the cortex like a crown of thorns. Is it really more of an esoteric message hidden in that story? Or is it a real physical story where somebody was beat down and hung up on a cross? Like I say, they just also found the, uh, the book of Jesus' wife, which is located at Harvard Library, which he got married. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of holes in that story, but is there more of an esoteric message behind this crown of thorns that we missed, that we missed? The neural correlates of consciousness. Could this be the crown of thorns that we have to activate in order to be born again? See, to be born again doesn't have anything to do with getting with, with dying. This is the biggest thing that people are they're missing out on. A lot of people on this planet are waiting to die so they can live. Why would you want to wait to die so you can live? You're supposed to live now. The main goal and purpose behind that book, and I've read that book now probably 80 or 90 times, I've analyzed every single word, phrase, I've broken it down to, from to, uh, Hebrew to, to uh, uh, Arabic to um, uh, all the different languages, uh, Aramaic, and I'm discovering that what's really being said here is, if you take out all the garbage and all the crap that was orchestrated, bring heaven to earth. Be your own savior. That's the true story. That's the whole message. That's really the whole message. And if you do a good enough job, you'll be born again. Born again into another body. Like it says in the book of Revelation, with a new name and a new body. A new name and a new body. That's reincarnation. Just like we create video games. You try to beat the level. And if you're not good enough, you die. And then you get another chance to come back again. And you play again until you can get to the top master level. Okay? We duplicate everything. As above, so low works on video games too. Because why? That's inside of our bodies, inside of our day. Everything we do is going to replicate that same exact process. Reincarnation, we built our own reincarnation system in video games. Same exact system. These neurons connect to the colostrum. The colostrum uh, is like the conductor of an orchestra. It coordinates inputs and outputs, which then help download consciousness. It's, a, it's located in the hemisphere highly on, it's located in each hemisphere on a highly dense region for perception, movement, vision, and hearing, okay? This is a powerful part of the brain, and uh, it's really important. You know, I'm amazed that I, it took me a long time to even learn this information. I was never taught this, and uh, even when I went to MIT for that course in neuroscience, we talked a lot about the brain, but they never told me about this. I had to find this out on my own. This is just, you know, magnetite crystal here at the bottom. In the top, you see, um, you know, two uh, Marvel comic guys who have Iron Man going against, uh, um, What's the magnet guy again? Magnet. Magnet. Magneto. So, you know, they, all the people who write these stories, you know, they have a good fundamental basis of some of these, some of this information. They try to put it into enlightenment through entertainment. They try to put it out there in a way that people get it, but maybe not get it, but they're utilizing information that already exists. It's all about light. 
So let's analyze that for a second, okay? So you're in a body made of light, housing your light being. Now you have a brain that has the capability of creating these um, movements of synapses between neurons to create conscious thought or act on conscious thought. And when they put a, um, you know, like a, a, a cover on your head with electrodes in it, and connected to a computer, they can see the light frequencies bouncing around inside of your skull. So every time you think, not only does it bounce around in your skull, but those thoughts leave your skull. Otherwise, how would they be able to capture those waves? So every thought you're thinking, including even at this exact moment, those thoughts are leaving your skull case and going out into the ether of space-time, interacting with other frequencies but it's like a fishing line still connected to the real. Those thoughts are going out and they're still kind of connected to you. And sometimes they reel things in and sometimes they don't. But the thoughts are connected directly to your mind and going out there. And what's really amazing about this is these are light frequencies. So now we, we create, we, we take light frequencies that emanate from our skull and we turn them into solid objects. We manifest reality with them in the third dimension. How does that work? In my mind, on the consciousness platform, I'm now thinking about a cell phone. So in my mind, I'm seeing a cell phone. Oh yeah, I would like to have this phone and this is what it would do, this is what it would, this is what it would look like and everything else. Okay, interesting. This is what I want, I want to make, I want to manifest this cell phone into, real, into a third dimensional reality. So what happens next? The next part is, okay, I'm going to now send this information into a CAD designer. The CAD designer is going to put it into a two-dimensional platform or an artist is going to render it into a drawing, which is still two-dimensional. And then once I'm satisfied with that, then we're going to give it over to an engineer. And the engineer is going to turn it into a three-dimensional physical object that we can touch in the third dimension. So from a conscious light, wave of light that came out of somebody's skull, Magically, this, 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 this just appeared. It's a real thing that you can touch and hold and utilize. This is the power of light thought. And it's something that we overlook and don't realize that we have the capability and power of doing every single day. And if we didn't have this power, there would be nothing here. There wouldn't be a podium, a microphone, a laptop, a screen behind me, clothes on me. There'd be nothing. We wouldn't have anything because we wouldn't have manifested anything. We are the gods of the third dimension. We are creating as we go, every single day, seven days a week, but we take it for granted. So when something comes up in our life, and now we're going, oh, back to get well, I can't figure this out, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, so forth and so on, not realizing that the same light power in your mind that is creating everything in this dimension is the same light power that can, you can utilize to get out of your situation or change or try to make it better or fix it or learn from it or whatever. Okay, so you should never feel in a position of being like you're hopeless because the power that created everything that's here is, is inside of your body and inside of your mind. Every single thought is a wave of actual light. Kal-El, you know, I mean, just interesting because I like Marvel Comics, but, you know, I like cartoons and stuff too, but, but Kal-El means light god. It's actually um, an Arabic um, or Middle Eastern name that they gave uh, Superman, even though he's a European guy. It's kind of funny, but, you know, it's all good. The story, the story is really an esoteric message again. Uh, there's a couple things in this movie that are really interesting. The more, you know, whatever this one was when he came up with this new S. But the story overall really dates back to Tiamat. There's a planet, what well, used to be a planet in our solar system named Tiamat. And this planet now is the asteroid belt. That's what the asteroid belt is. It's an exploded planet. Uh, it's well documented in many ancient texts, as well as even the modern day Bibles, called the hammered bracelet in the Sumerian tablets. It's in the Enumi Elish, it's in the Atra Essus epic, what actually happened there. But this planet was about six times larger than Earth, water bearing planet with land and intelligent being, intelligent life on it. It collided with some moons of this Nibiru planet as it uh, was gravitationally uh, 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 captured by our solar system in ancient times and it caused it to literally break into many, many pieces. One giant piece swung away with all of the organic material needed for life on it and re-coalesced right here. That's where Earth came from. That's how we got here. We weren't here at the beginning of the solar system. 
we're literally a part of another planet. The rest of it broke into chunks. Um, one of the chunks is still big enough to be called a planet. Has anybody here ever heard of Ceres? S -E, I'm sorry, C E R E S, Ceres. It's right outside the orbit of Mars, a couple people in the back. So you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Oh, don't forget, there's another planet right there you didn't know about called Ceres, C E R E S, in our solar system. It has more fresh water on it than Earth. Yeah. But unfortunately, they don't talk about that on CNN all day long. Um, that was also a chunk of this previous planet that turned into an asteroid belt. So right side of Ceres is the asteroid belt, and then you have the gas giants further on after that. So, um, you know, it's really amazing, but when you look at the story of Superman, you have the planet that he's living on that's got these geological disasters and the planet's gonna explode. Same exact story, right? Really interesting, and then he leaves this planet and he goes to another planet, and because of the sun, they say, he's stronger. But in true reality, I believe it's the gravitational field and the way that his uh, body interacts uh, with, our, with our color of photons there. But what's amazing is if you went to Mars right now, which is two-thirds less gravity than Earth, every single one of us in here would be a superwoman or a superman. You'd be able to pick up a giant boulder. You'd be able to flip over a car. You'd be able to dunk on a 20-foot rim on Mars right now today. Yeah. Why? Because it's less gravity. So your bone structure grew up under more dense gravity. So and on another planet, you'd be a quote-unquote god. You see? I think some of those people um, escaped to other places. And then when Earth coalesced and became a fresh planet again, some of them came back here. When you go into some of these deep, deep coal mines on Earth, they keep breaking up pottery 500 million years, 300 million years, 200 million years. Where is this stuff coming from? They even found this one stone with a computer circuit, uh, circuit chip on it, embedded into regolith that dates back million, millions of years. How is that possible? My theory is, and it's something that I'm working on with um, a few people and working on like a mini documentary about it, my theory is that these things are part of when we were part of another planet. I think that we were part of another planet named Tiamat, uh, and um, so with, no matter how far down you go, you're going to find remnants of ancient civilizations that may not have been part of this epoch or this era. Can brainwaves interfere with radio waves? <laughs> not likely. Brainwaves are too slow and, and, uh, and are so weak that they're extremely hard to measure. But radio waves and brainwaves are both forms of electromagnetic radiation, waves of energy that travel at the speed of light. That's why I put this article up here. Understand the power of your thoughts. Your thoughts travel at the speed of light. Okay, they literally travel at the speed of light and they're powerful just like radio waves. So when you transmit a radio wave um, to a, 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 a crystal, it can pick up and decode that information and convert it into information that somebody can listen to. When you think something, sometimes people who are on the same frequency as you can pick up that information, call it intuition, call it psychic capabilities, whatever, but it's real. Psychic powers, so a lot of people fake it, a lot of people make it up, a lot of people make money off of it, but there are a certain amount of people on this planet that have those psychic powers real, and it's not magic. It's because they're literally taking a download screen uh, of your thought light, your thought waves, just like a radio signal. Now imagine beings coming here like these in the Turu uh, in ancient times that had abilities that were mind-blowing abilities, but they may have been integrated with technology. There's a student at uh, Harvard University that um, came up with this machine, this invention that he just puts over his head like a headset, but it touches the bone right behind his ear. And by that method, he's able to hear sounds from this. So he sends his thought light wave directly into this device that's not injected, not through any operation, just resting on his head with a piece on his bone. And he's able to ask him questions. And that link, that headset, is connected to Google. And he asks any question you want to ask. And it will then look it up on Google and it will transmit the answer right through the bone, right to his mind. Can't hear nothing audible. Yeah. And then everybody would think that that's what? God. This guy's a God. He knows everything. He can tell you anything. He can answer any questions. He's God. So you go to another planet with that kind of capability, with a less uh, advanced civilization, you're a god. You know everything. You know, the all-seeing eye.
It has to do with that black line satellite that's in space right now above our heads. It's been there for 13,000 years. It was part of Enki's all-seeing eye system. He had the capability of seeing everything, everywhere. He was omnipotent and omniscient because of technology, not because he had any kind of special powers other than what a uh, hominid, you know, you know, God-given powers already are metaphysically. Yeah.